Among the most influential ideas in this country over the last generation is the idea that the government is terrible. It's the problem, not the solution. It's oppressive. It's slow and stupid. It's a leech. It's basically the DMV. Well, in this pandemic, many are waking up to just how essential government is, doing the thousand unsung things that stand between us and havoc. And behind the 10-letter word government are the human beings who do these unsung things, civil servants who seldom make the covers of magazines, but who keep our society humming and decent. Joining me now are three proud civil servants. Aaron Brown is a facilities maintenance technician for the United States Postal Service. Dr. Nancy Sullivan is chief of the biodefense research section at the Vaccine Research Center at the National Institutes of Health. And Dr. Neil Evans is chief officer at the Office of Connected Affairs at the Department of Veterans Affairs. Now, when I told my producers that I wanted us to all talk together, I got some uh, questioning looks. We're sort of like the beginning of a joke. A journalist, a PhD, a postal worker, and an MD walk into a, a bar um, over Zoom. But stick with me, and hopefully this will all make sense. I want to begin, begin by asking Aaron Brown uh, the following question. Uh, your duties for the Postal Service, as I understand it, include everything from plumbing to installing TVs, two things that never occurred to me needed to be done at the United States Postal Service. Tell me about what your job is every day and how it's changed since COVID. Thank you for having us on. You know, it's, it's good to have someone that um, a show dedicated to the experience of, you know, civil servants, you know, those of us in the government. So I do appreciate you guys doing that. Um, my job, um, like you said, I'm a facility maintenance technician. We work out of the headquarters building for the United States Postal Service, which is a, a basic a million square foot office building. The president of the United States recently famously called the, your work, the service you work for, a joke. If the president is listening, can you answer the president's characterization of your job? Call it a joke. That was embarrassing. That was, you know, a very bad statement in my opinion. Uh, he's basically basing that off of all of the bad propaganda the Postal Service has received over the last 10, 15 years as far as, you know, not being able to uh, well, always being in a hole financially. That hole is from a congressional mandate where we retire, we fund retiree health funds 75 years into the future for some employees who hadn't worked for the Postal Service when Congress made that law. Some hadn't been born yet. Operationally, we're solvent year to year most of the times, but that number you see in the media is bad. So I don't think the president has a proper understanding of how the Postal Service works when he makes you know, statements like that. I wish he would get a, a better understanding of the true financial situation the Postal Service is in before he kind of takes what you know, the very general statements about our financial situation and make an assessment on it. Yeah, it's, it's sort of a only in America thing that we, we could even talk about uh, essentially a government agency losing money. They're supposed to lose money. If your government agency is making money, you might, you might have a bigger problem on your hands. And Dr. Sullivan, one thing you and I have in common is that we've both done really important things in our life. I, over the last weekend, I baked not one, but two different loaves of bread, um, and they were both they were both okay. Uh, you developed a treatment for Ebola, so that's you, you've also done you know things of significance. Don't feel bad at all. And you now are chasing uh, your team, I presume, uh, vaccines for for the current pandemic. Can you just explain what the work of actually chasing these vaccines and cures is like, and 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 where we are right now in in this search? So I. I think, again, it highlights the role of government because the NIH is here to work on high-risk research projects that maybe biopharma would not because there either isn't a funding stream for that or an anticipated profit. So the NIH forms a, a really fundamental part of preparedness for any virus or other pathogen that comes along that we might not be prepared for. So with Ebola, I had actually been working on that since 1998. So for the Ebola vaccine in 2014, it was really because we had been working on that so long at NIH that we had all the tools and understanding of the virus that was needed to move quickly. And so just to unpack what you said for a second. So you're saying working on that in 1998, starting to work on it, would simply not have made sense 
for a corporation. Why? Because there would be no obvious profit stream for an Ebola vaccine in 1998 because the outbreaks at that time were very sporadic and small numbers of people. So it probably wouldn't make sense for most companies to pursue that. And that's where the US government is really important. And the Vaccine Research Center, where I am, was set up specifically to do both basic research and be poised to move things very quickly to phase one. So we are a group of interdisciplinary scientists that cover all of the disciplines needed to move things through basic discovery, to animal testing, to manufacturing, and then finally phase one trials. And it's that structure that has enabled us to pivot when needed and move very quickly. So there's all this talk right now around the vaccine um, about billionaires stepping in and Bill Gates having this this attempt that he's making. There being, a, I think, distinct, quote unquote, Manhattan project that a bunch of private sector people are kind of doing in secret. Do you view those kinds of efforts as helpful, you know, collegial collaborative efforts? Um, and what do you make of the rhetoric that tends to surround them of billionaires swooping in to, to save us when people like you are doing this work every day, year after year? I think every pair of hands, no matter where in this process is helpful. Even very, very manicured ones. Yeah, <laughs> very manicured ones. No, it, this is, this is um, a problem beyond any proportion that we've experienced before, as you know. And while every scientist is committed to working as fast as possible to bring either a vaccine or a therapeutic um, to patients, I think we really do need all hands. Dr. Neil Evans, your job involves making the VA uh, a remotely accessible health service. Uh, and you were actually doing that before it became urgently necessary with, with COVID. Um, can you just talk about why, again, as with Dr. Sullivan, why the government was thinking about this before it happened and what it involves to treat so many people remotely, especially now? Well, first of all, within the VA in general, the mission of VA's healthcare enterprise is to serve veterans. And that's, I think, really one of the, the great things about service in government and particularly in the VA is that the mission is abundantly clear. And we are a healthcare system where we need to deliver healthcare to veterans uh, who are eligible for care from the VA wherever they are in this country. And they may be in particularly rural parts of the country. They may have difficulty even in urban parts of, our, of the country getting into the clinic um, and connecting with their provider. VA has always had a commitment to innovation um, and to, to leveraging technology to improve care. Um, and that's really what we do in the Office of Connected Care is that we, 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 we build um, technologies that allow us to connect with patients as part of their daily lives. We have more than 5 million patients who are registered with our online portal. Um, we uh, you know, answer millions of secure emails from patients on a yearly basis. Even before the pandemic, we were probably the country's largest provider of telehealth care, more than 2.6 million visits last year, uh, more than 1.3 million video visits with patients. This is doctors being able to meet with patients where they are and deliver care across a distance. I'm going to make an argument to you that I don't believe myself, but is an argument that you hear a lot. The private sector is so much more efficient, right? Do you, anybody who's dealt with the IRS and Amazon in the same week will understand what we're talking about. Respond, any of you, let's start with Aaron, to this notion that it would be better if all this stuff was just made private. Speaking from a postal aspect, um, you know, we have a universal service standard to deliver to every address in the country. You know, same price, same service, you know. You couldn't do what we do in some of the more dense populated parts of the country that you would be able to do in somewhere like rural Iowa or rural Missouri. It's just not profitable in those areas. So, you know, the idea that everything can be sold by the free market, it's, it's good theoretically, but it's just not applicable sometimes. The scientists here could make, I don't know, three to five times as much as they're making in salary by going to private industry. So the government gets a very good value 
for people who are highly committed to what they're doing. Um, and, you know, people are working around the clock because we're just committed to public health and public service and the science. So, Dr. Evans, we're going to do a quick lightning round with you. I'm going to, you know, raise some of the words that people often use to, to, to smear the government, frankly. And you tell me in each of these words, is it no truth in the word, a lot of truth or some truth? All right. Uh, corrupt. No truth. Slow. No, I don't think so. Bureaucratic. Um, you know, here's the thing. I, I think um, the, the government, when we're talking about delivery of health care, we are committed to delivering a top quality service to veterans. And you have professionals who are motivated. These are the same professionals. We train 70% of residents in this, in this country train within the VA. So the same physicians who are delivering care and let nurses, social workers, et cetera, who are delivering care in the private sector. I mean, now most of them trained in the VA and have actually learned how to deliver that care, right? So I think, I think that the, the key point is any large organization has some bureaucracy in it. Um, but frankly, that's actually what allows you to deliver uh, a consistent product is that you've created rules and regulations around what is it that we deliver, that's actually, there. there's a good part to bureaucracy. So from that perspective, yes. From the perspective of, can I do the things that I want to do in government? Absolutely. There's all kinds of room to, 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 draw, to innovate and drive and solve, the, solve problems for the American public. Wasteful. I do fewer duplicated tests than I would have done in the private sector. I'm actually more efficient in how I'm able to recommend things to patients because I have the data that I need. Uh, so I, I would say no. So this notion that's very common in this country, the government takes away your freedom, last of your, of your prompts, Dr. Evans. I mean, I think in general, right, the government is here to serve the American people. And so um, again, I'll, I'll just go back to my clinic this morning. What was I there to do? I was there to give people freedom. Those who have the veterans who actually earned all of us the freedoms that we live for in this country, that we have in this country, I was there to give back and to give them the freedom that they need to, to serve them in the context of helping them to live healthy lives. So again, I think the government has an opportunity to really serve its, the citizens and, and the government is at, is at its best when that is what it's doing. And frankly, that brings freedom uh, more than anything else. What kind of language, what kind of frameworks should we communicate to the American people about what government really is, Aaron Brown? We should definitely communicate the importance of the things like the Postal Service does as far as we deliver medicines and especially times like this during the pandemic packages to places that wouldn't be able to get it through Amazon or FedEx without you know, extreme high prices. And it's easy for people just to be negative sometimes in my opinion, instead of having a full analytical understanding of the entire realm of what government can do. Uh, Dr. Sullivan, as you, as you probably know, in, in recent years, I don't know what the latest statistics are, but at the top colleges in this country, half of graduates, fully half, were going into two micro niche industries of finance, high finance and, and management consulting. Um, and you just have a very, very small fraction of those kinds of graduates attracted to public service in the way you did, let's say, in the 1950s and 60s. What would your pitch be? It's, it's, it's May. Uh, a lot of people are graduating over Zoom at this time of year. Um, what would be your pitch to young graduates about making a life uh, of the kind you have in, in public service? So NIH tries to recruit young people to public service through some training programs for students who are in the middle of their undergraduate career in summer programs, or when they finish their undergraduate career before they go on to graduate school um, or medical school. And, and I can tell you that, that that works very well. So bringing people to NIH to help them understand the importance of what we do and instill in them some of the same values that brought those of us who are here uh, to this endeavor, I think is a very helpful way to keep people invested in public service. And then, of course, something like what you're doing here, Anand, is priceless, you know, to help 
give a voice to people who are in public service to say why they do it and why it's so important. Um, before I let all of you go, I want each of you to take take a turn responding to the following sentence, which I heard in reporting uh, a couple years ago. The government is us. The government is just, it's just us. It's a version of what we have created together. Um, I would just love each of you to take a turn responding to the notion that the government is us. I guess I can start. Um, yeah, the, the government is us. I mean, we elect politicians. We have to hold politicians accountable. We have to hold the services of the government accountable. If we just elect politicians and don't really follow up on what they're doing and how they're doing it, that becomes this, you know, this, you know, they and us, you know, where we're not a part of the government. The government is like a third party entity. I would agree, right? I mean, the government is filled with more than 2 million workers. These are American citizens who have committed to serving the American public. They've committed to working in a career uh, that, that actually serves themselves in many ways, right? I mean, the, the gov- two million of our, of our 300 plus million citizens in this country are, are coming to work every day um, to serve the, the nation as, as, at large. And so really the government is us, us I would agree. And Dr. Sullivan. Yeah, I think um, it, it really is an interesting question that you raise, because if that is the notion now that the government isn't us, it means we have a job to do, probably starting in elementary school with helping students to understand their role in participating in government to make sure that government is us and keeping that strong throughout education to encourage that participation. Well, I, I want to... Also note in thanking you all uh, that uh, Drs. Evans and Sullivan were recently uh, given a a very major honor, the finalists for the Sammys Awards, which which are sort of the Oscars for civil servants. Um, And and thank you all for for the work you do and for for coming on Seat at the Table to explain it to us. Aaron Brown, uh, Dr. Nancy Sullivan, and Dr. Neil Evans. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anand. Thanks. Goodbye. (laughs) 